Good morning. As long promised, we're talking today about this tool. If there is any single tool that is the ubiquitous, multi-purpose, indispensable tool for the tanner, it's the flushing knife. Of course, you also need a beam to use this tool at all, but that could just be as simple as a log or a big, uh, huge piece of PVC or something. The common term is flushing knife, but this is actually used for a whole bunch of different processes and tanning. It's used for flushing, obviously, but it's also used to go back over the flush side numerous times to clean off more of the tissue, and that's usually more than one step. Uh, it's often more than two steps, depending on the skin and other treatments. It's also used for dehairing. Say you soak it in a lime solution or some kind of alkali and then you want to slip the hair out to make uh, this type of smooth leather where you have the shiny grain left on it. Use this way to drag the hair out of the skin. It's also used in making buckskin to remove the grain layer, which is that shiny layer that I just showed you on that leather. Well, this leather is fuzzy because that layer has been scraped off. So that's a process usually known as graining, although traditionally in Europe it's known as frizzing. And finally, it's used for scudding. And let's say you're trying to rinse the lime off of the skin before you tan. So you soak it in clean water, and that swells the hide up with fresh, clean water, and it removes some of the lime, which is soluble in water. And then you throw it on the beam and use this to push it and squeeze the liquid out of the skin, squishing out all this gunk and dissolved um, material and stuff that you don't want in the skin and more of the lime. And then you return it to the fresh water, and then you do it again. And you, I often end up doing that with uh, bark tanning. I'll end up doing that, you know, six times. So I'm going through the process of scudding this hide. Now scudding is just the process of pushing liquid out of the hide. And I do that in between rinses. So you can see there's all this liquid coming out, but the liquid is still kind of milky. And also this is the flesh side and you can see there's still little strings and bits of flesh coming off. And I do that when I take it out of the tan. So if I put it in the tan for a while, then I'll take it out, scrape the flush side again to remove more of those bits of tissue left in the flush side, the hypodermis. I'll also press out some of the liquid and open the skin up and stretch it out. And then I put it back. See how clean that is now? And look at all this stuff we don't want. That's like the old flush side stuff. If you're soaking a hide up and it has uh, kind of stiff spots that aren't soaking up all the way, it's pretty hard to get in there and just stretch those with your hands. But if you throw it on the beam and you just kind of scrape over them lightly, it pulls and stretches them open and forces water in and out. And then you put it back in the water or the solution or whatever, and it soaks up much easier. So as you can see, this is a very important tool. We're going to go through my a fairly extensive collection of tools. We're going to talk about uh, commercially made tools and what to look for and also uh, homemade tools and what you can scrap together for yourself. Now these tools are used with two hands. Um, that has huge advantages. It not only allows us to uh, push much harder, it gives us way more control. You just have more control over the tool and, and where it goes because you have two grips on it. Like imagine trying to scrape with this with one hand, it would just be, you know, all over the place. The other thing is that we can adjust this way. So I can hold the tool at an angle and control it that way. I can just push it forward or I can slide it side to side and all those things are very important. If you watch someone experience with one of these tools, there's a lot more going on than you're going to be able to see. Pressure, angle, this way, um, angle this way, and how much they're sliding or not. Now the length of this tool is also related to the width of those beams and the type of work that was done in, in large tanneries. You can see that this tool is on, made on a, you know, the same style. It's just narrower because it's worn out and it's a lot shorter, but that's because someone actually chopped it down. So someone cut this down and then they brazed on a handle down here. And I got this one, this one, and that, that other big one I just had all at the same yard sale. And I think this is the end that they cut off of like a 24 inch knife in order probably to have something for working small furs. So my guess is they were like not real happy with this huge tool working on a small beam processing like, you know, furs and deer skins and stuff like that. And I think for home tanners, like this is a little bit smaller that you could definitely use it. That would be nice for handling some furs or something. 
but something about this size, uh, anywhere from about 10 to 12 inch uh, blade length, and then the handle's around four or four and a half inches. I think four and a half inches is pretty good. This is a, probably a five inch handle, not really necessary unless you have huge hands. But most of the really nice old traditional European tools like this are wide, like this. Weight is not critical, but it's nice to have a little bit of weight depending on what you're doing, especially if you're doing buckskin, like brain tan buckskin. It's nice to have that little bit of weight because once you get that weight going, it forms this inertia that isn't as easy to stop, so you can kind of like plow through stuff. Uh, but again, too much weight is just going to give you a workout that you don't need. This is, you know, reasonably heavy, but it's not that heavy because it's quite thin. And the reason it can be this thin and be this strong is because it has a compound curve. So it has a curve this way and a curve that way. This tool, on the other hand, is a real clunker. It's about a quarter of an inch thick. And it's just a big chunk of mild steel, basically. Pretty terrible tool. But again, within that range, there's a lot of options, and for the average home tanner, you just don't need to worry about it that much. And one last thing is it's really nice to have tools of two different sharpnesses. So I usually end up using two different tools when I'm tanning a hide. Two is enough. It depends on what I'm doing. So if I'm making buckskin, again, like this, I have uh, different things to do. So I have to, I have to flush the hide which I usually want a little bit sharper scraper for, and then go back over this once or twice. And then I want to scrape off the grain. And for that, I want a little bit duller tool because you have to push really hard. And if the tool's too sharp, it's going to cut into this layer and you're going to mess that up and, and it will, you will be able to see it. It'll be permanent uh, damage. So that's one scenario. The other scenario, again, would be making grain leather like this. So this has the grain left on it, the shiny layer right here that we removed on the buckskin. And all I want to do with this is push the hair out. So I'm going to loosen the hair with chemical action using uh, lime and water or ashes and water. And then all I want to do is push the hair out. And that's actually a pretty easy job. It should be easy. If it's hard, you probably need to put it back in the lime. For that, you can actually use a really dull, I like a really dull scraper because I don't want to damage that grain at all. So instead of scraping, like with the leading edge cutting into the hide kind of, in that kind of cutting action, I'm going to flip this around, lay this on the hide, and then that way I'm actually dragging the hair out backwards with the edge but I would still prefer that that edge be pretty dull. And you can actually use wood for that. I mean, you could actually just kind of get the edge of, sharp edge of a board or something like that and use it to, you know, de-hair a hide or two probably. And again, for flushing, I want a little bit sharper tool. So it is nice to have a couple tools. It's nice sometimes to have an edge, you know, two different edges, but you, you're gonna want those, like with all the curve tools, say like this one, they keep, a lot of trappers will keep this side really sharp, the outside curve, and then this is, is fairly dull for flushing. And they, they just use this to, to do really hard areas or to get underneath membranes and stuff like that. But even if you dull this to a different um, sharpness and get it where you want from some other process, this curve is just not that great for most tanning processes. So if you have a double-edged knife for, again, your average tanner, home tanner, and you want two different sharpnesses that you're gonna use on a regular basis, you're gonna want something with two straight edges. Okay, let's go back now to the beginning. Bones. So this is a rib bone, uh, large rib bones like this. I think this is a buffalo bone, unless it's a horse rib. Uh, but this was used for flushing a bunch and finally it broke right here. Obviously pretty easy to make this into a, a scraper. It's not a very good scraper because it's curved this way. It's kind of weird, but uh, it does work. So all you have to do is take a flake of stone, you know, knock off like a sharp flake of stone or broken glass, uh, snap it in half to get square edges, and then use those square edges to scrape like this. Another cool one is the ulna radius bone. So in a deer, what's equivalent to their forearm or, you know, here, so in us, this bone is here. It's actually two bones, the ulna and the radius, and they're sort of fused together with tissue. And this also is really easy to prepare because it already has kind of a sharp edge here. Again, same thing, take a stone flake, snap it in half to get square edges and just scrape that sharp. This is something you can get out of a deer and use it to scrape the hide right away without too much effort. 
A slightly more sophisticated version is this. This is a moose or elk leg bone from the lower leg, which in us is more equivalent to one of these bones in your hand. Um, I think it might be two of those fused together or something like that, but you know, we don't have that extra joint that a deer has that's equivalent to our hand, really. Uh, this one you just take and you hollow out the inside of the bone like this, and that gives you two working edges like that. Uh, to make one of these with stone tools is a little bit of a, a chore. If you have steel tools, you can take a hatchet and just chop this out, especially when the bone is green. If it's not green, you can soak it in water. Take the hatchet and just chop like this and just hew out the inside of the bone. If you have a good hatchet, and it's not ridiculously sharp, that shouldn't damage your hatchet at all. So this is much better because uh, it gives you two working edges, it's much more comfortable, and these are found, you know, in areas with large game where hides were processed a lot. You might find these tools like uh, the Northern Indians in Canada. The most important piece of information for bone tools is that they kind of suck. They just are not that good. They dull incredibly fast. They work fine when they're sharp, but they don't stay sharp. So you're going to be constantly sharpening them. Interesting to try sometime just to know that you can do it. And obviously it's cool to be able to do stuff like that in the field, but for regular use, forget it. All right, let's get started on these guys. Okay, these you can find real cheap. They're made of mild steel, so they're not tool steel. They won't hold an edge. You can get them for like 15 bucks, so it's tempting. And you could definitely do the work. I mean, you can get away with these for sure. But if you can afford it, definitely go up a step. One thing I don't like is I always have this dog leg. So they're just bent in the middle. They're not, they're not a continuous curve. It's like they took this on some kind of press and set it here and just pushed on both ends. And so it's flat and then there's a little curve and then it's flat. Um, you know, not the end of the world again, but not preferable. Uh, again, they're mild steel, so they don't hold an edge. This one is just absurdly heavy. Like, I don't see any advantage or reason for this to exist. Maybe I'm missing something or it's just the type of work I do, but no thanks. So if you can afford to go up a little bit in uh, price and quality, do it. Also, you'll often see these on like eBay sold as vintage or antique flushing knives look for this wire wrap right here it's this uh ferrule right here is just a, a piece of wire wrapped around and then welded or soldered so speaking of going up in price and quality this is a necker model 600 necker makes a bunch of flushing knives this is the only one that i have and i actually haven't used it yet um, i just got it as a review item i, I was haunting ebay looking for a good deal so I could review it. Definitely better quality. This gets really good reviews all around. It's slightly flexible, stainless steel. It has two edges. This one comes as a sharp knife edge and this one comes very dull. It's got the curve. My initial impressions are as follows. Again, I have not used this. I don't like the fact that this is so curved and that the handles dive way down because it puts my arms out at an angle. I'm not, I'm not flushing the hide in this direction and that direction. I don't mind a little bit of curve here. I probably want a little bit of it, but I don't want this much. I'm not sure about that. And I actually just don't like the handles. I don't like this big clunky part here. It's hard plastic. It's very hard plastic. Um, they seem a little bit on the small side to me. And I'm just not, not that crazy about the handles. These are about 70 bucks new. And like I said, they make several different models, but I don't know that much about them. The equivalents are Weeb and Caribou. And those are both uh, kind of like 70 to $90, I think, all stainless. Now Weeb makes one that's a budget line one that I'm not sure is even tool steel. So that, that may not be tool steel, do your research. But it, otherwise it looks pretty good. This again is the traditional European style of flushing knife or tanning knife and it's uh, awesome. This is a, just a beautiful tool, a real real crap piece of craftsmanship. So again, it's uh, relatively thin. It has the compound curve this way and this way, which uh, gives it strength and allows it to be this thin. It just gives it all this like rigidity. This size is really oversized for a lot of people. And again, you know, this size right here, this one that's been chopped down is actually a really good size for a home tanner. Now this is a newer version of this and it just does not reek of quality like this does. This is obviously forged. You know, I can still see hammer marks all up and down here. It's got that unevenness to it. This is definitely made on some kind of a, you know, drop forge or press or something like that. It's very, very uniform. It's thicker. 
if we take this off here, you can see this tang is just a short, it's kind of weird actually. I almost wonder if it's broken and I shouldn't take this one off and look at it, but the tang doesn't go all the way through on this one. The tang goes all the way through and it's riveted on the end. The tang on this is forge welded on. It's, um, you know, it's not one piece. Like this is just stamped. So they were able to just take this piece of metal, cut it out with a, you know, probably like a plasma cutter or something, put it on a, something and stamp it. So I haven't brushed this and cleaned it up yet. I got it on eBay for 25 bucks with that and that, but I had to haunt eBay a long time to get it. If I knew it was this new and of this low a quality, I probably wouldn't have got it, but it's still pretty damn nice, honestly. This is kind of a problem. You can see that um, that handle actually that I knocked off actually split, uh, probably largely due to this weird, you know, cheesy tang right here. Now you can still buy these newer Sheffield knives, but they're about 150 bucks. And I just saw one of these on eBay, same brand, uh, Horn and Brothers, I think it is. WH Horn and Brothers, there's a stamp right there. I saw one of these on eBay for 150 bucks. Would I buy this over that? Oh, hell yeah. I would definitely buy a used version of this over a new version of that for the same price. Obviously that's a lot of money. There's not that many people who can justify spending that kind of money. You know, if you haunt eBay long enough, eventually there's a good deal's gonna come around and you're gonna snag some old rusty thing. Someone doesn't quite know what it is. These are amazing, but again, you know, they're so long that I don't think it's really the best choice for most home tanners. If you find one of these at an antique store in good shape for 50 bucks or something like that, that would be a steal at this point in time. Okay, let's move on to homemade tools. So uh, one that I like a lot is uh, ones made from planer blades. These are um, used in mills to plane lumber. A sharp blade and you set uh, three or four of these in a, a round cylinder like a rolling pin say and that spins super fast and when you feed the lumber underneath it it shaves the lumber down to an even thickness and smooths it off. So that's why when you get a two by four it's smooth instead of having just like rough saw cuts. They do this a lot all day long so they have a lot of these and they keep sharpening them and sharpening them and when they get too dull or too narrow rather they toss them in a pile so if you're lucky you can go to a mill and or a sharpening shop or something like that and ask them for these used planer blades and sometimes you'll score a whole pile of them they are really cool because the steel is uh, just this weird special steel it's very very hard it holds an edge incredibly well it's hard to sharpen but it holds an edge incredibly well you, you, it's hard to work with though so you can't drill it the way it is right here i mean you probably can with a special bit or something but you can't drill it you can grind it basically and sharpen it and that's about it also sometimes you can get these with two edges so this one has two working edges uh, that other one has some notches cut on the back so i can only use one edge of it so the main option with these that, that's going to be accessible for most people is to grind the handle section down till it's an inch wide and you can just use like a four inch grinder or a bench grinder or something like that. Grind that down to an inch wide and then take just some sticks like this, like a one inch stick, split it in half and then put one half on the other side of the, the blade and pound them on with a piece of tubing. So this is, I think, one inch inside diameter tubing. Uh, a large hardware store will have this on a roll and you can buy it by the foot. So then you get a comfortable, easy to clean handle that's round, don't have to drill it or anything like that. Now I've seen uh, quite a lot of these that were made with just a piece of tubing smashed over this without any wood. And it makes this kind of real flattish oval handle. I really don't like those. If you have access to a grinder or go to someone's house that has one, grind that thing down and do the tubing thing so it's so much more comfortable for any kind of protracted use. You know, if you need something super quick or you don't have access to a grinder, you know, maybe wrap it with some rags and tape until you can get to that. Now, if you go especially to a saw shop, like a, a sharpening service, uh, look in the phone book, they'll often have pieces of this sitting around. So this one is just this like scrap that's about 12 inches long. This was a piece that was 12 inches long because a lot of planers are actually only 12 inches wide, especially the ones people use in their shops and stuff like that, not the big commercial ones. 
if you're lucky enough to have antler, you can mount it with antler handles because you only need about, you know, like an inch and a half or something to go into the antler to make a reasonably solid handle. One and a half to two inches. Obviously more is better. So the way that works is antler has a softer, spongier pith. Well, I wouldn't say it's soft, but it's porous. It's like a, a sponge. But when it's dry and cured, it's, it's actually quite hard. And then it has a hard outer rind. So if you match the width of the tang, like you grind the blade down till it just fits with inside this hard rind. So the hard rind goes from here to here and inside of that there's say an inch. So I grind my tangs down to one inch, soak this in water overnight, um, boil it for about 15 or 20 minutes till it's hot all the way through, and then you just pound it on and leave it until it's completely dry and set cured and it should set on there in most cases sometimes it doesn't but usually it'll set on there really nice that makes a durable easy to clean super cool handle if you have the right pieces of antler but often it's hard to find something that's actually going to be comfortable this one here is also uh, elk antler handles they're nice one other option for any kind of straight blade or planer blade is just to do this. So if you can't drill it, you don't have tools and it's too short, like this is only 12 inches wide, this is just dulled on the ends and it's tied to a stick, like a slotted stick. So I made a slot in here, slipped the thing in, tied it on, it works. It's not great, it's not my favorite tool, but it totally works. So that could allow you to use all manner of different, you know, scraps of steel or pieces of metal. Okay, this one I banged out of a piece of leaf spring. I think it was an old wagon leaf spring. It's actually really nice. I really like this tool. I did I do a few things different. I really banged it out super quick, so I wasn't being that careful. The edge could be could have been made wider. I could have made the tangs, uh, you know, more carefully so that I left more edge. But this is about the size of tool I like. Four and a half inch handles with an 11 inch working area. It's got a mild curvature, but not too strong. I don't believe that I ever tempered this. I think I just banged it out um, and started using it. It looks like it's about 3 16ths of an inch thick. So I said that was made from a wagon leaf spring, I think, but these leaf springs are just not that hard to come by. If you find like old, you know, scrapped cars somewhere, you can just crawl under there and usually just loosen a couple bolts and, um, or a few bolts and you'll get it off. So you can see this one has like 11 springs in it or something like that, and they're long. Some of the ones on the bottom are actually already straight. The other ones would have to be straightened out and forged. But the straight ones, you could probably just, you know, if you're patient, you could grind something out without having to forge it and retemper it or anything. Chainsaw bars. These things, if you're in timber country, these things are really easy to come by. I understand that they're made from tool steel, you know, carbon steel, but I've never used one for anything, so I don't know, but it seems like a no-brainer, you know. It's a nice uh, flat bar of steel. It's about the right thickness. Lawnmower blades. I don't really know how these work. I don't know if they're tempered, if they're tempered on the, just the ends and not the middle. So you might need to throw this in a forge, straighten it out, but there's definitely some potential there. And these are also not that uncommon. Another thing that might occur to people is to use an old file. Um, I'm sure the steel is great. Obviously there's a tang here already. You could make another one here and I could see that being a nice tool. But you're going to need to take all these teeth out, all the teeth on the whole thing. You can do that. I mean, if you anneal this, just throw it, you know, get it red hot and then throw it in some ashes and let it cool. You could take another file and then file, carefully file those teeth out and use it so it's an option for sure but if you're at that level already and you're going to put it back in the forge and temper it and everything you really don't need me to tell you this but i did want to say that if you're going to make a tool like this you probably want to take all the teeth out because if nothing else they're going to catch gunk and salt and water and it's going to cause the tool to rust a lot more and generally you don't want any rust on your tools. And finally, this is not a fleshing knife, although you'll often see these listed as fleshing knives on uh, say like eBay. This is a courier's knife. So this is actually used for thinning leather. It's not used for making the leather, it's used after the leather's finished. The courier, the guy who, who took the leather out of the tannery, often it was still wet, would finish it in different ways. And one of the things they would do is thin it because if you're gonna send it to all these craftsmen, the shoemaker and the carriage maker, 
they're going to be like, hey, you know, I can't make a carriage top out of this hide because it's, you know, two or three times as thick in this spot as it is in that spot or whatever. So after it was tanned, they'd throw it on a beam on the flush side. It's actually like a, a straight board, and then this is used like that to shave off thin shavings. And this is actually a turned edge like a cabinet scraper, so it's sharpened, and then they would turn the edge over like this and roll it into this hook. In fact, this one I've never touched, and I can still feel the hook on here. It's actually a, a real strong hook. But you'll often see these listed as flushing knives, and they are not. This is one that I made that's on a different style. So this is like a, a piece of bandsaw blade bolted to this handle that I forged here. Okay, so there's a lot of options. You know, obviously you need a few skills to make one of these, but not that much. If you get a four inch grinder, does everyone know what that is? I'm gonna go get one. This is the ubiquitous four inch grinder. Oh, angel singing. These things are amazing. This is just, you know, an indispensable tool for metal fabrication. And this is just a grinding wheel. So this is, this is what you would need, but you can also put like flap sanders, wire wheels, uh, diamond wheels, and all kinds of stuff like that. So those are great, but you can also just use a bench grinder. If you're shopping, again, I would avoid these really cheap knives. It's kind of wasted money. Like if you if you think you're gonna go up in quality later, do it now if you can. These actually hold their resale value pretty well. I mean, it's hard to find one for like, you know, $50 even, and they're 70 new. So you're gonna be able, if you wanna sell it later, you're probably gonna be able to get most of your money back. I would consider making your own tool. I really, again, like this. It's, it's uh, 3 16 of an inch thick, and it's got a, a moderate curve to it. And a, about 11 inch blade is really, I think, a great size for home tanners. Anything between 10 and 12 inches. There are other new options. For instance, someone is making um, like, a uh, knockoff version of this in America that's way cheaper. So I think the 12 inch one is 50 bucks. And that's something I've been wanting to try to see how, how good those are. That could be an option. For used, I would say you're just gonna have to haunt eBay for a while. You're gonna see tons and tons and tons of these. Quite a few of this type of, you know, next level up newer flushing knives. And occasionally you might find something that's along this lines of pattern, but actually a, a, a real curve and not just this sharp curve. That's something to look for. If you see this dog leg right here where it goes straight and then it bends and goes straight again, avoid those at all costs. But if you hunt long enough, you're gonna find, you know, the occasional quality actual vintage tool that's all made along this pattern that's actually really nice. If you want more information on doing furs and tools, check out uh, Coon Creek Outdoors. He has some good videos on flushing knives and on flushing. I mean, these guys who are trappers have to be able to flush things efficiently. And it's so they, you know, they're really good at it and they have a lot to say about it. M much more than I have to say about flushing furs. Okay, that's about what I have to offer you for that subject. I know this is a big problem for a lot of people. They're interested in doing tanning but just don't have access to the tools they need. And this is the first tool, is, is this and a flushing beam. That's what you need. Until next time, keep those tanning dreams alive. Um, making leather is immensely satisfying and fascinating process. A lot of you have probably thought about doing it, or maybe you've seen some of my videos or other videos, or always thought it would be a cool idea, or you read My Side of the Mountain, or whatever. Keep those tanning dreams alive and just baby steps, you know, keep plugging away in that direction. I keep telling people, I don't think most people listen to me, but listen to me. Squirrel skins are perfect to learn tanning on them. Right now it's uh, it's September, so it's fall. Acorns are just going to start dropping here pretty quick. Squirrels are going nuts, they're literally for nuts, and they're, they're going to get hit on the road all the time. You know, here, every time I drive to town between about now, and, you know, for like a couple of months, I'll usually see a dead squirrel on the road. You know, if they're fresh, get those, or if you're a squirrel hunter, if you know someone that is, get those. Squirrel skin is actually pretty nice and it's the perfect like mini experiments to learn on so you don't you don't invest a lot of time you know you can screw something up and all you wasted was a little squirrel skin you didn't do this you know what how many squirrel skins can you fit on a deer skin so you're doing like 20 times as much work for a deer hide and then you go through the process and you're like oops 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 I did that 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 you keep screwing stuff up you could have done all that on a little you know 
10 by 8 squirrel skin or smaller. Save those squirrel skins. You can just uh, skin them out, you know, open skin them or case skin them. So open skinning means you slit down the belly and slit out the legs like the classic, you know, picture of someone skinning an animal with the dotted lines. And the other way is to cut from one back foot to the other back foot along the inside of the back legs, cut around the anus, and then peel the whole thing off as a tube. So that's called case skinning. Either one of those, um, usually you don't have to flush it even. There's rarely very much flesh on it, or if there is, just put it on a log with a butter knife and kind of scrape some of it off. Uh, dry it inside out. Like if it's case skinned, you can just take a green stick and bend it into kind of a U shape and shove it in there and um, twisty tie the legs, like stretch it out and twisty tie the legs to the end and just let it dry that way. If it's flat, um, you could use galvanized nails. Don't use anything that's gonna rust, but galvanized nails are fine, nail it to a board. And you can also just freeze them, but save those squirrel skins. And if you get a squirrel skin, there's already enough information in my videos on uh, making the straps. So making straps from scratch, there's like a whole series of videos or in one playlist. There's enough information in there to take a squirrel skin and turn it into bark tanned leather. And you don't need that much material either, right? You know, one piece of firewood, oak firewood with the bark on, or two pieces is gonna be enough to tan the squirrel skin. Again, much, much easier to learn on than starting with a whole deer skin or something like that. Later days.